So hello and good morning to everyone, at least in Europe, and good evening to Steve Keen, who is in Australia and a little advanced on uh, time this day. Um, we are very happy to have you in this uh, discussion today, uh, which is the first new forum for new economy, economy uh, shortcuts that we're doing this year. 2022, and uh, it seems quite natural to have uh, something like this book discussed in this uh, format and at the Forum New Economy, as the book that we will be talking about is uh, the one that Steve Keen has published uh, recently, and it's called New Economics, uh, a Manifesto, and it's about trying to, to get around this, what could be a new economic theory, what could, could be a new economic thinking, a new economic paradigm, criticizing the old ones and, and putting mu very much at the forefront uh, the main obstacles, the main, uh, the main problems of the old and neoclassical model. Steve Keen, I don't have to introduce you, you uh, largely, most of uh, people know you, you're a professor of economics uh, you know, from Australia, you've written this very popular book on debunking economics, which was a sort of a first step leading to the, the current book, and um, as you um, told me, um, you have started, and it's very important for, for economists to do that at some time, sometimes, uh, to try and enter to, into politics, um, mm -hmm. be a candidate, candidate for the New Liberals Party in Australia for the Senate and mm -hmm. uh, for the elections where we come up in, in spring. You may perhaps say some words on that in a, in a minute. Uh, I would shortly introduce uh, also uh, both other um, um, panelists who will comment on, on your introduction and Petifor, uh, prime director and very famous known for a lot of inspiring ideas around new economic thinking, and Peter Bofinger, um, former member of the Council of Economic Advisors or Council of Wise Men, um, uh, which is funny because now you're a former wise man, but um, maybe you're not wiser than before um, or, or even wiser now than before. Um, so very happy to have you from University of Würzburg and I just reminded um, the panelists that one year ago we had a discussion with also Peter and Greg Mankiw about uh, his famous and his very important and influential macroeconomics uh, textbooks and a very uh, lively debate with Greg Mankiw trying to defend um, his thinking. Um, I think we will go and make another step today, um, trying to find what is wrong about this and what may be a new answer. So, um, very happy to give um, to, to, uh, for you to take over, Steve, and give us mm -hmm. an introduction, the first view of your book, and then we will start the discussion with uh, the panelists. Thank you. Okay, well, I'll just uh, start sharing, sharing my screen now. Can you see my screen? Uh, yep. Yes. Good, okay, and I'll just actually minimize, I might actually move the, uh, the, the participants bar down the bottom, which seems to uh, take up less of my presentation space. So this is the, um, those are my current publications, including a, uh, a couple of cartoon books, and this is the New Economics, and uh, the two websites supporting my Patreon website, of course, which is where I publish most of my work and where I'm supported, and then the Prof. Steve Keen website, which has got a role in the Minsky as well. And what I pretty much ask in the book is a, a bit of an inversion of the question that um, was asked by Veblen in the, you know, the previous, one of the previous centuries, the end of the, end of the, uh, of the uh, 19th century. Why is economics not an evolutionary science? And what I'm asking in 2022 is why is economics neither a science, nor evolutionary, nor truly revolutionary? And part of the reasoning I, I go through in the book is that it doesn't undergo scientific revolutions. Uh, practitioners of neoclassical economics will regard rational expectations of a revolution. That's basically window dressing on the same paradigm. They all accept the whole, exactly the same paradigm we saw back with um, Jevons and and, uh, and and Valras and Marshall back in the, uh, the, the late uh, 1800s. And if you look at Thomas Kuhn's structure of scientific revolutions, what he sees a genuine science going through is a period of normal science where accepted ideas are extended, 
Then you hit an anomaly. The anomaly is resolved by a revolution, which changes how you consider the science to be. So for example, in physics, the quantum mechanical revolution overturned the previous Maxwellian vision, which saw energy as being continuous, suddenly we have energy coming in, in discrete uh, uh, units called quanta. Uh, then you have a new paradigm which comes along, it becomes the normal science, then it strikes an anomaly and you continue repeating this pattern over time. And if you look at the neoclassical paradigm, uh, the same idea of utility maximizing behavior, profit maximizing behavior, uh, optimization, rising marginal costs, falling marginal benefit, et cetera, et cetera. It's all been there since the 1870s. And there've been plenty of anomalies, but never a revolution. Keynes came close, but he was basically, uh, there's a coup d'etat with John Hicks coming in. So the, and the anomalies themselves, when we look at anomalies in e economics, they're not like in physics where they're repeatable experiments, which don't go away. They're, un they're unrepeatable events, which can be ignored and forgotten, which is what has happened. And what you get as a result is that a new generation comes along, which behave like true believers, just like the um, people who taught them beforehand. You don't get that generational change. And what Veblen had to say about economics being helplessly behind the times in 1898 is still true in 2022. But of course, it's much more critical now than it was even then. Now, in that, I have several exact parts to the book, so I'll go through each of the major segments. So I spent about 65 pages talking about why money matters. And if I built, draw it down to its essence as to why money matters, it's because one of the few things that everybody accepts in macroeconomics is that aggr <coughs> aggregate expenditure is aggregate income. They are identical. Um, so that's the, that's the accepted principle. And using that principle, neoclassicals normally rule out any role for money or credit. But what I show by using a, a particular application of endogenous money theory to show that credit is part of aggregate demand. Now, I won't go through this table in detail. This is what I call a, a Moore table after, you know, honor of Basil Moore. But if you show expenditure on the horizontal and income on the vertical, then you can show that the, the, the negative section, the, 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 the diagonal there is aggregate expenditure by each group. And if, if credit is coming from the financial sector or the banking sector creating money, which is then spent by the recipient, then credit becomes part of aggregate income. This is the only piece of maths I'm going to show in the presentation. But when you put it together in a loanable funds world, you credit cancels out. In the real world of endogenous money, what I call bank originated money and debt, credit is part of aggregate expenditure and aggregate income. And therefore you cannot leave the monetary system out, whereas of course neoclassicals try to exclude it and just to talk about real economics, leaving out the monetary system. So credit, because it's so volatile, it has the dominant role in aggregate demand and aggregate income. Now, what that means, and I illustrate this with my Minsky software, which I've designed to fundamentally enable system dynamics type tools to show how monetary economy works. And this is a, a model I use in the book at one point. Actually, it might, might be in a companion book, which I'll talk about in a moment. And what I have here is, uh, if, you, if you know Paul Krugman, Krugman talks about patient people lending to impatient people and <laughs> banks just being an intermediary. And what I show is that that's the case. Uh, then with the parameters I've set this model up with, there's an increase in the amount of lending, there's a decrease in the amount of GDP. Now I then very quickly, and it takes me about 30 seconds to make this change, uh, but just what I want to first emphasize, debt and GDP move in opposite directions in this model, and there is no change in the amount of money. The money is the black line there. With a, a few simple changes, I go across to the real world, where the, where the bank does the lending to the so-called impatient person. Um, there's no role for the patient person or for reserves in the whole lending process. And what you find is, simply with that structural change, uh, lending and GDP move in the same direction and changing the amount of debt changes the amount of money. So it's a fundamental change in how we think about the world when you bring in the role of, of credit and money as post-Keynesian economists have been arguing for decades. So you, you, it is a complete transformation of macroeconomics to bring that in and credit plays an essential role because it is so volatile. And I always go back to uh, Bernanke dismissing the role of credit in the explanation of the Great Depression. But if you take a look at data, which actually was available to Banker when he wrote that book, you look at the unemployment rate and credit, which is the annual change in, in, in private debt. Uh, over 1920 to 1940, you find a minus 0.81 correlation between the two. Uh, call me picky, but I think that's a bit different from zero. So it is a significant macroeconomic impact, and it's even more obvious when you take a look at the period from 1990 to 2015, that rising credit meant falling unemployment and vice versa. 
enormous correlation of point, minus 0 0.93. And that should be, even empirically, that should be looked at by neoclassicals. I've yet to see any of them consider it. So they're basically ignoring the dominant factors in macroeconomics. And I show how it's possible to bring it in in a logical, coherent framework. Um, but the, the, probably the main, one of the main elements which is novel in the book is the argument that, you, that there is a legitimate reason to say macroeconomics should have indisputable foundations in the same sense that physics and chemistry and biology have indisputable foundations. But they don't have to be. In fact, they cannot be microeconomics because we understand complex systems these days and complex systems have what we call emergent properties. Uh, behavior can come out of a system which cannot be explained by any single component of that system or by extrapolating a single element up. So what you can have is what I call the macro foundations of macroeconomics. I don't put any maths in the textbook, but I show that if you take the employment rate, the wages share of GDP and the private debt ratio and the differentiate them with respect to time, you get three strictly true dynamic statements the employment rate will rise if economic growth exceeds the sum of change in the output to labor ratio and population growth. The wages share of GDP will rise if wages grow faster than GDP, and the debt ratio will rise if debt grows faster than GDP. Obvious and actually true statements. You can turn that into a model very easily with a couple of genuinely simplifying, genuine simplifying assumptions. And what you get, as I show in the book and also in a companion book, is Minsky's financial instability hypothesis with an added twist that wasn't predicted by Minsky, that there, before the crisis occurred, there'd be a period of diminishing cycles and then rising volatility afters, which is what we saw during the so-called great, uh, great Recession. And that actually is a, is a phenomenon known in chaos theory from fluid dynamics, and it turns up as the foundational concept in macroeconomics. You also get, as you can see on this chart here, the rising level of debt goes with a falling level of workers' share of GDP, whereas rising debt doesn't change the capitalist share of GDP. And that's another thing we see, that rising debt has gone hand in hand with increasing inequality. And this is a causal explanation for that phenomenon. Uh, the next major element I add is talking about the role of energy in production. And if any, if you, any people who are strictly economists, they'd know uh, that you have the Cobb-Douglas production function describing output as being a function of technology times labor times capital, both to powers that sum to one. Um, the the uh, Leontief model having output being a function of capital divided by capital output ratio, there's no explicit role for energy. So what I've done there is I explain in the book that energy is an essential input. And when you put it that way, you get a complete transformation of how we think about production. And ironically, I find myself actually liking something Larry Summers had to say, which is an extremely rare phenomenon. So let's let's have a bit of a, maybe Larry can call in and, and, and take, take the applause. Um, but he talked about the financial crisis as being like a power failure. And he said, there'd be a set of economists who explained that only the electricity, if there was a power failure, it's only 4% of the economy. So if you lost 80% of electricity, you couldn't possibly lose more than 3% of GDP. And he said, people would actually write papers like that and they would be stupid. But he said, we'd know it was wrong, even if we didn't quite know why it was wrong. So what I want to illustrate is why this is correct, is once you see energy as an essential input to production, that if energy falls by 80%, then so will GDP. And the reason that matters as an example is that if you take a look at the state we are in right now, how much of our energy is contributed by non-carbon-based systems, fundamentally still mainly hydroelectricity, it's less than 20%. Now, if we're forced by an undeniable climate catastrophe, let's say a collapse of the weather systems in the Northern Hemisphere, uh, which mean a, a, a breakdown in food production up there, and nobody can argue against that this is climate change, then what you will see is an 80% fall in GDP if you are lucky. Because if you take a look at the, that, that's the level of, uh, the red line is level of uh, renewables as a percentage of total energy production. And it was only 14% back in 2017. It might be 18% now. And if you take a look at what happens with change of energy versus change in GDP, it is a virtually linear and one-to-one -one relationship. So if there's a fall in energy, there will be a huge fall in GDP. But because economists ignore it, uh, they've completely ignored climate change, or they've, they've, they've to totally misunderstood climate change. And I frankly think they're, they're going to be guilty of ecocide. I think mainstream economists that have been involved in this work deserve to be prosecuted for ecocide as once that's made into an actual crime, as much as anybody in, Ex in Exxon or, uh, or the coal companies will be uh, deserved to. Because if you read Nordhaus, he says things like this, and this is still how they think. It is difficult to find major direct impacts 
on manufacturing, mining, utilities, finance, trade, and most service industries over the next 50 to 75 years. That's because they can imagine you can produce output from those industries without energy as an input. Uh, and that led to him assuming that 87% of industry would be unaffected by climate change. And the IPCC, at least when Richard Toll was part of it, repeats the same garbage. I'm waiting to see what this year's report comes out and says. But here there's a frequently asked question, are there economic sectors vulnerable? And they say manufacturing and services take place in controlled environments and are not really exposed to climate change. <laughs> they pretty much think only 13% of the economy is really going to be exposed and really only 3% is agriculture. And of course, we can ignore that. It's only 3%. What would it matter if food production fell with only those 2% of the economy? Uh, but I digress. Uh, and they do crazy things like this. This is one of the data. They make up their own numbers. So all the empirical stuff you see, and I go through this in the book in a fair bit of detail, all the so-called empirical stuff is taking current data like this, which is on the horizontal axis, the deviation of uh, temperature of each, average temperature of each state from the average for the United States, and on the vertical deviation of average income per capita from the average for the United States. And if you fit a quadratic to that, you get an extremely weak correlation. And that's what they use as a prediction of the impact of climate change. The correlation I get there uh, gives, me, gives me a coefficient of 0 0.00318. So for each degree in temperature change squared, you get a 0.3% fall in GDP. And that's actually larger than Nordhaus uses in his DICE model. So what it's implying is we have a six degree increase in temperature, we'll just have an 11.5% fall in GDP and Nordhaus's figure is even smaller. And this actually ends up supporting trivialises like Bjorn Blomborg. <coughs> so Blomborg comes out and tells Extinction Rebellion and Greta Thunberg that all we're gonna lose is two to 4% of GDP, who cares? Now, the point to me is how exactly can we imagine economists helping with climate change if they're providing talking points for climate change deniers like Lomborg? And that's really the state of macroeconomics. When you read the genuine scientists on this, they're terrified about two degrees. This is several uh, major papers by Hansen, Will Steffen, and Tim Lenton saying anything around one to two degrees could be catastrophic for human life. And they talk about a, a series of tipping points which could each trigger each other and push us onto a hothouse earth, which would be antithetical to human existence on the planet. So economists have trivialized this and said, nothing to worry about with six degrees. Scientists are saying anything near two degrees and hold on to your hats, we could lose the habitability of the planet for human species. We should do everything we can to avoid 1.5 degrees. So mainstream economists, particularly Nordhaus, but quite a few others as well, have delayed action on, on climate change for 50 years. And I think that's what's going to bring neoclassical economics unstuck. They won't be brought unstuck by anomalies in capitalism. They will cause the collapse of capitalism. And we will then have to pick up the pieces afterwards if we're lucky. Now, uh, and then why do they do us? Well, they start from being denialists. This is some quotes. So I, I think the real starting point they have is that capitalism is such a flexible economic system. Just look at our supply and demand curves. They can move really easily all over the over the blackboard. So they're muddy, you know, the economy does the same thing. Isn't it hunky-dory? Uh, and therefore, capitalism can't be an existential threat. That's how they start thinking about it. And these are some quotes from this literature, which is just breathtaking. Human societies thrive in a wide variety of climatic zones. Yeah, that's the current climate. That's not the one we're causing. Non-climatic variables swamp climatic considerations. That's your starting point. Uh, and most, most of the respondents who are mainly neoclassical economists, uh, a three degrees warming would be small potatoes. And one of them, I'm sure this is Larry Summers, it takes a very, very sharp pencil to see the difference between a world with and without climate change or with and without mitigation. And that's the mental framework they're bringing to the picture. And because the politicians listen to economists and are only trained by it, that's what they actually believe. But in the same paper, there are three climate scientists interviewed in these, among these 19 people in the so-called expert survey. One of them refused to answer the question, saw them as absurd. The other two, in all the scenarios they were given, had estimates of damages 20 to 30 times higher than the economists were looking at. So we're look, talking about an order of magnitude, maybe two orders of magnitude, more damages coming out of climate change than economists are talking about. Whereas economists are saying the impact of climate change will be small relative to virtually anything else you can name. So, so in my opinion is having looked at this work, it's not no case economists should do better measurement. They should simply shut up on measurement and accept what scientists have concluded and work out how to do something worthwhile. Now, how did this stuff get published? That was my real surprise when I saw it. I thought I'd have to explain 
Ramsey growth models and why they're inappropriate and stuff like that. We've barely even got to that point. It's the assumptions that they make, which are nonsense. No other, no genuine science would have allowed the sort of assumptions that neoclassical economists accepted in these papers. So we have a fundamentally unscientific methodology, courtesy of Milton Friedman, and that's what's led to this impasse. And economics will be the profession most responsible for the collapse of capitalism. Now, talking for the future, and I'm in the book, I'm also saying, how do we do a new economics? I want people to learn complex systems analysis, which means they have to learn as young students at least ordinary differential equations, learn system dynamics and use my Minsky software, which I used extensively in the book. Forget about learning this at economics departments, do a study in your own time. I probably, you won't get a lecture to the Oxford or Cambridge about it, but forget about that as an ambition. Um, you'll be part of the solution rather than part of the problem if you take a new approach to economics and you get an interesting position outside economics by learning system dynamics and avoid the blame when climate change exposes neoclassical economics as fast because just as people outside economics think neoclassical economics is everything, if you introduce yourself as an economist after this has happened, you'll get the blame. Call yourself a system dynamicist instead. And that's just, all the, by the way, a link for those who want to go further than I cover in the book. The book deliberately is written for a, to be accessible to a non-technical audience. It's still a fairly technical book, but there are no equations in it. This, I've got a free book on that page, which is about 250 pages worth explaining Minsky and going into much more technical detail. So I'd love to have students take a look at that. And that will do me for my presentation. I'll hand back to Anne and Peter. Just, just so I can stop my sharing, yeah. Wow. Thanks very much, Steve. <laughs> um, well, this very, very comprehensive um, critique and, and um, uh, sum up the main ideas of your book, uh, going through nearly everything. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, you still got to buy it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, um, we, we're not here to, to make... <laughs> um, but anyway, I'll show it anyway. Uh, so this Good, is the book you. where you find all... These bring, bring it back a bit. Thomas is actually obscuring a bit. Yeah, bring it back towards your face. Okay. Yeah. This? Whoops, we've lost you. Oh, that's okay. <laughs> okay. Vaguely, I, that's it. Yeah. Try and uh, make a copy. Um, yeah. Thanks a lot. And I hand over to Anne. Oh, that's nice. Thanks, Anne. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, yes, thanks ever so much, Steve. Um, and can I say that the book is entirely accessible? And thank God it doesn't have mathematics and system <laughs> uh, dynamic systems in it because for someone as simple-minded as myself that would be too much but it's a powerful book and it's very concise um, it's not too long um, <clears throat> and so I really do welcome it and I welcome it particularly because of what Steve has to say about economics and the environment um, but it's equally true about economics and the economic system, the financial system, mm. um, and, and the devastation that has been caused. And we, I mean, I knew Steve before 2007, but, you know, we knew this was going to happen. Steve had yep. produced these wonderful charts on the levels of private debt and how far they'd risen. I was obsessed at that point about sovereign debt. And it was very clear to us that this was not sustainable, that it was going to blow up. But when it did blow up, we found ourselves really quite alone. Um, you know, central bank governors, powerful economists, influential economists couldn't believe what had happened. They were stunned. They stood there as quietly, not knowing what to do. And the problem with that is that the system, far from being transformed by its failure, far from being improved because of its failure, actually consolidated itself. I mean, the, the bankers, the financiers, those who had gained massively from the bubbles and who gained from the bailout, essentially, um, couldn't believe their luck. You know, none of them mm. went to jail and they all carried on. And levels of debt are now higher than they were pre-2007. And I, I, I myself every day look at these numbers and can't believe that the that the system is still operating essentially. So we we know there's going to be another implosion, another debt deflation, to accompany the debt inflation that has been a, a feature of this last ten years. So. Um, you know, I do welcome this book and I do hope it'll get read by a lot of people and, and you won't be intimidated by 
that Steve's brilliant uh, mathematics and systems. I also just wanted to add one thing, which is that one of the great crimes of economics is to neglect its geniuses, to neglect the people who really have the insights. And Steve is one of those, one of those people that is neglected by the economics profession. But it goes way back. Um, one of my heroes is John Law. Now, John Law was um, was known as a a gambler. He was a brilliant mathematician. He, 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 would, he was able to make calculations very, very quickly. So he was a superb gap, gambler and speculator. He was a womanizer and he was done for murder because um, it was an obscure event uh, that occurred in his life. So, you know, he, there are lots of reasons not to rate him. But Schumpeter says about John Law, who wrote about money back in 1705 and who understood money, the nature of money. He explained that money is the measure by which goods are valued, the value by which goods are exchanged and in which contracts are made payable. They are not... They are, it is not the measure for which goods are valued and for which goods are exchanged. And, and that was an insight in his book uh, on, la on the land, on money and trade, first published in 1705. Joseph Schumpeter says about John Law that I always felt he was in a class by himself. He worked out the economics of his projects with a brilliance and, yes, profundity, which places him in the front ranks of monetary theorists of all time, says Joseph mm. Schumpeter. So, um, you know, these, these are people that did have insights, but that were marginalized and they continue to be marginalized. They're not given places in un at, at universities and they're not published. The sectarianism, the ideological sectarianism in economics is a wonder to behold. Mm. And, and, you know, they should be ashamed of themselves. And, and what it shows us is kind of timidity and, and fear of mainstream economists occupying these uh, positions of power in economics and unwilling to let them to let their positions be undermined. So Steve is a breath of fresh air in this world of economics. And uh, I'm delighted to see this very accessible and interesting book. And of course, Steve is one of my heroes for the reason precisely that he's exposed to the fallacies, the flaws in Nordhaus's analysis, and which is still accepted by, I was listening to <clears throat> uh, some sessions of the American Economics Association, and I heard Nordhaus's uh, ideas being <clears throat> promoted by American economists. So he's still in the center of this debate. And that is terrifying for the, for the whole of humanity, uh, never mind for the economics profession. So thank you, Steve. Thank, thank you, Anne. I'll actually add one of my heroes as well, or two of them, Cantillon and Canet, uh, because again, we've, we've neglected them. If we'd built an economics on their front, and I do mention them, them in the book, it'd be a totally different economics because it would understand the role of energy in production. And I'll actually quickly do a quick share of my screen just to make that point. And for those of you who've read Andrew Smith's Wealth of Nations, tell me if the first paragraph here looks familiar. As this is Candeline writing well before Smith, land is the source or matter from which all wealth is drawn. Man's labour provides the form for production. A wealth in itself is nothing but the food conveniences and pleasures of life. That is almost verbatim what Smith lifted and made labour the source. And that just diverted us into the, um, into the walls over the sources of value, when in fact the first people to get it right were the physiocrats. If we started with them, we would have a physically realistic economics. So we don't just forget our heroes, heroes we assassinate them and lose their ideas. And that applies both to, to Cantillon and to Canet as much as it does to law. Okay, thanks for adding. Uh, Peter? Yeah, thank you very much, Thomas, for inviting me again. We have this very interesting discussion with Mengyu one year ago, and now it's really fascinating uh, to have the opportunity to discuss the book by Steve. Um, I will share my screen a little bit. Where is it? So. Oh, so, okay, can you see it? Yeah. Yep, we can. Yep. Yeah, so let me start by saying, I think this is a great book and it's really needed uh, because it stimulates the discussion and debate in economics 
which is definitely needed. Um, the main elements of the new paradigm that uh, Steve uh, proposes are, a funda are that the paradigm must be fundamentally monetary, uh, that the paradigm must present the economy as a complex system, not as an equilibrium system. The paradigm must be consistent with laws of thermodynamics. Mm -hmm. It must be grounded in empirical realism rather than the fantasy of as if assumptions about reality. And it must be based on the techniques of system dynamics. I think these are the key elements of the paradigm. But as I have only very limited time, I want to focus on those elements where I also feel a little bit familiar with. And I want to start uh, with the, uh, with the, with the uh, key uh, requirement that a paradigm must be fundamentally monetar monetary. And I fully agree here uh, with Steve. I think here a revolution is definitely needed um, because even after we've ex experienced uh, the financial crisis in 2008, 2009, there has been no change in the, in the dominant paradigm of neoclassics. And um, I, what I find here important is uh, Schumpeter, he is really my hero in this field because he very clearly differentiates between the two paradigms of what he calls real analysis, which is more or less a neoclassical paradigm and with monetary <coughs> analysis. And um, I think here he's really the founding father. He's of course also the uh, teacher of Minsky who plays a very important role in, in Steve's book. Um, unfortunately, Schumpeter is, has been very much misinterpreted in the neoclassical literature. That's why we have just uh, written a discussion paper, uh, which we call Discovering the True Schumpeter. The True Schumpeter, which is the monetary Schumpeter. Unfortunately, in the standard literature, he's presented as a real analysis Schumpeter. So what are the main insights of Schumpeter? And of course, the insights that you find in Steve's book. Well, the key insight is that banks are not intermediaries, but producers of purchasing power. And from this, of course, derives the destructive power of excessive private debt, uh, which has led uh, to the financial uh, crisis. And as a positive uh, element of this insight uh, is that there are no financial constraints for governments, a point that is, is made in the book and which is the key insight of modern monetary theory. So here I fully agree uh, with, uh, with, with Steve and, and fully agree that a revolution is, is needed. Um, what I also appreciate is to use accounting identities as consistency checks. I think this is also very, very important. Uh, I, honestly speaking, I must say, I find the goodly more tables confusing, but maybe it's due to the fact that I did not have enough time to get in to, too much uh, into these tables. But I really have a question then to, to, to Steve. Uh, is, is uh, and, and the question is why does do these tables not include real assets? I, that I found really it's only in a footnote, and I, I cannot imagine how one can uh, model the economy uh, with, with these tables without real assets. Um, I, I also do not fully agree with the idea that a debt jubilee would be non-inflationary. Um, I think. Debt jubilee, which increases the net wealth of private households substantially, would have a huge impact on their spending decisions. And so I think uh, with, with such a debt jubilee, you would have very inflationary uh, effects, uh, which I don't think uh, would, would be a good idea. So let me then go to the macro foundations of macroeconomics. So Steve argues there's no need to drill down to microeconomics, and he argues by simply taking core definitions and turning them into dynamic statements, we can build foundations of macroeconomics. I'm not really convinced that this is a good idea that you can, without behavioral equations, make sensible macroeconomic models. And um, so my question is, are there really examples uh, of empirical work which shows that you can explain reality with such models? For instance, can you say something with these models about uh, the impact of the pandemic and the reaction of fiscal and monetary policy to the pandemic, is this something you can describe uh, with these models? And I must admit, uh, I still believe in the ISLM model, which is very much criticized in the book. Uh, 
I think uh, the ISLM model is very much misinterpreted in the literature because it is a monetary model. It has two dimensions. The IS curve is the goods market, but the LM curve is an independent monetary uh, dimension. And in this LM curve, you have a central bank, you have commercial banks creating money, you have private investors deciding to hold bonds or cash. So this is a truly a monetary model. And I must say with this model, it's very easy to explain what's going on in reality. You can explain uh, the COVID shock, you can explain the reaction of fiscal policy, monetary policy. And I think you even can even explain uh, modern monetary theory. So I think maybe a second look at the SLM model might be, might be useful. Uh, finally, we have the neoclassics disease. And here, as Steve says, uh, the neoclassical theory of price being set by the intersection of supply and demand can't possibly correct. Uh, and he very clearly uh, explains how he comes to this, to this statement. But he also says, we will not displace the neoclassical totem from people's mind without our own mathematical and visual alternatives. And so I must say, I don't, don't see these alternatives. And I don't see in the book any simple, frugal, pedagogical way to provide an alternative to the, to, the, to the simple supply and demand analysis. And I must admit, uh, as, as a writer of a, of a textbook, um, that the standard supply and demand uh, schedules, although they have all their problems, are a very useful tool to explain many things that are going on uh, in, in the real world. For instance, what are the effects of a monopoly of cartels? Um, you can explain what is the effect of a minimum wage if you have a competitive labor market, but you can also show what is the effect of a minimum uh, wage if you have a monopsony on the labor market. You can explain carbon pricing and all these things and throwing away the whole supply and demand uh, apparatus, uh, I think it's very difficult to say anything meaningful about many important issues in, in the real world. So let me end by saying that, yes, we need a revolution, but I would see that the re revolution is mainly needed in uh, macroeconomics, where we need the monetary analysis as it is propagated by Schumpeter in Minsk, instead of the real analysis, neoclassics, which still dominates almost all the thinking of leading economists in this, in this area. Um, in microeconomics, of course, new approaches are welcome, but in my view, they must be frugal and simple to be digestible for students. So let me end by saying that Steve's manifesto really helps to stimulate a deba debate which is needed. Um, here, by the way, this is Luther, uh, to which uh, uh, Steve explicitly refers in, in, in the movie. Uh, but I think one should be careful not to throw out the baby with the bath uh, water. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. I'll make some yeah. comments there if I can. Okay, yes. um, first of all, I, I see ISLM. Oh, hang on a second. What happened there? We just saw there. What's happened? You're there. You're still there. Oh, good. Pardon me. I, I, I dis it disappeared from my, must have disappeared from my screen for a moment. What, what occurred there? Pardon me. I have got to see if I can actually find my Zoom window again. It just disappeared. You so you can still hear me, can you? We can yes. still see you can, and hear you. I, I can't. I can neither see nor hear you, which is a real problem because I wanted to show my screen and I can't actually. I want to just bring up Zoom and see if I can actually do it by going. It's going to join a, join a meeting. I'm, I'm flummoxed. I don't know what's happened there. Uh, okay, leave web webinar. Can there we go? Come back. I got it through Zoom. Good. Okay. Um, a whole lot of questions. Why did I use uh, um, what, the, what I call uh, godly tables rather than um, uh, tea, tea tables? Basically because it's impossible to do the uh, guarantee that assets minus liabilities minus equity equals zero condition on every element of a tea table. Uh, I find them, we have one graphic, which is like a static sta snapshot at one point, another graphic, which you might have, it might have grown or shrunk, another static view. It's very hard to show it dynamically, whereas if I... Now that I can actually show my screen again, this is, I'll just show this particular model here. This is a model of a, um, a, a model where I combine the real economy, as you were talking about a moment ago, with the monetary economy. This is the monetary model, and double entry bookkeeping is by far the best foundation for that. Uh, but the remainder, this is a 
a Goodwin growth cycle model, which is, includes the role of, of private debt. And uh, what does actually just yes, includes private debt as well. So I bring the two together. So the flow chart elements here, which is this section here, is what gives you the, uh, the overall dynamics of the physical, the real economy. And it's linked with the monetary system up here. The whole idea is to integrate the capacity to model in a monetary way, as well as being able to model in a physical, whereas so far we've, we've really had them as two separate realms. So this is two tools combined on the one canvas. And um, in terms of saying, you know, we want a simple thing for our students, I think economics is too simple. I'll give you a little joke here. My, my, my wife has no interest in the work that I do, uh, but I found out early on that she actually, when she got, first got married, it was when she was actually studying an economics degree. And I asked her, why did you choose economics? Her answer was, because it was easy. And if you want to pass an exam in microeconomics, it's just, you know, where, where do the lines intersect and what other lines do you have to add and so on to answer it? It's too simplistic. If you see what engineers do in first year, it trivializes what economists do. And I think this is to our detriment. Engineers use things like system dynamics uh, when the package is called Simulink in particular, which is, this is, this, I mean, Minsky is a, is, a, is a relative of that. And they're using differential equations. They've got dynamics going on. We should be modeling the economy the way it is, not with static uh, 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 time slots like supply and demand curves and ISLM. So we completely disagree on that front. Uh, also ISLM, if you read, um, um, Hicks and the, the, the key papers to read in the 1935 wages and wages and profits, the dynamic problem, and then uh, ISLM and explanation in 79, uh, 80, 81. Uh, he tells you that it was a neoclassical model. He derived it before he read Keynes and he realized in 80, 81, after many conversations with Paul Davidson, uh, that it was not at all Keynesian and that equilibrium was incompatible with Keynes's own thinking. So I'm afraid we've got to, to agree to disagree in ISLM. I think it should be thrown out. And so does John Hicks, who developed it. If you read that, if you play, read, please read ISLM and Explanation in the Journal of Post-Keynesian Economics in the 80, I think it's 8081 or 8182 edition. And it's a pity that uh, Hicks published it there because it was the thank you to Paul Davidson for opening his eyes over the whole thing. But it meant neoclassical economists never read, never read Hicks's own uh, dismissal of his own tool and saying we shouldn't use it unless equilibrium is, is, is in only the very few situations when equilibrium actually applies. So we do have a fundamental disagreement there. And also in terms of things like microeconomics and so on. Um, yes, I'd be ha happy if you taught microeconomics if it was honest. Now, if you take a look at supply curves, well, what is the supply curve supposed to be? It's supposed to be the marginal cost curve above average, minimum average cost. Okay, so it's marginal cost curve. When you look at the empirical data, and this has been done by people up to and including Alan Blinder in the, in the late 90s, and I quote this in the book as well. Alan Blinder went and surveyed, what it turned out to be something like about 15% of American manufacturing firms. And he found that 89% of them reported constant or falling marginal costs. Now in that situation, you cannot have a supply curve. It's gone. There's no honesty in microeconomic textbooks that teach that. And it's, it's the only excuse for it is ignorance. But funnily enough, Alan Blinder doesn't have that excuse because he learned that. And I had a bit of fun, and I'm rewriting debunking economics on this front for the third and final edition that I hope to start later this year. In his textbook, he does not mention his own empirical research. He simply regurgitates the whole idea about diminishing marginal uh, productivity and therefore rising marginal cost, uh, saying, and actually claims it was found by observation rather than empirical logical deduction, when in fact it was supposedly a logical deduction from the idea of fixed inputs and variable inputs. But in the real world, it doesn't apply. So what we teach in microeconomic textbooks is a fallacy. And I'm not, I think it's about time we were honest with ourselves and say, why are we teaching empirical fallacies as the foundation of what is supposed to be an empirical discipline? So we're going to have to strongly disagree on that one, Peter. And I really think I'd like you to look at uh, Alan Blinder's book. Uh, one of the things I find ridiculous is how economists don't read their own literature when it criticizes what they themselves believe. Now, Alan Blinder's book, Asking About Prices, is published in the late 90s. It's been around for, is obvious, for 20 something years. It's about the same generation as Maskell's textbook. If you take a look on Amazon, you'll find Maskell's book has hundreds of reviews, hundreds. You'll find Blinder's book has one review. And I wrote that review. In other words, what doesn't fit the, the ideology is ignored, and that is a travesty of economics, and it's time it stopped. And that's one reason I wrote um, uh, the, new, uh, the new economics. We simply have to abandon fallacies, which have been the foundation of this discipline for the last 130 years. Can I um, 
Can I just comment on Peter's um, presentation as well, which was very clear and, and, and very comprehensive mm -hmm. about uh, Steve's book. I just have a difference, and I fear I may have this difference also with Steve, uh, when, you, uh, when you put it down in writing as banks are not intermediaries, but producers of purchasing power. They were your I, think, yeah. I don't think mm -hmm. that's right. I think the producers mm -hmm. of purchasing power are the borrowers. Um, and banks, I think by putting banks at the center of this, we're making the banks too powerful. The fact is, when, when, the, uh, when the population loses confidence and withdraws, contracts borrowing, um, the, you know, that makes a huge difference. To, and when the, when the population is euphoric, confident, believes that everything's hunky-dory and going to go well, um, then they increase borrowing. And when they're encouraged to do so by the authorities, um, and in particular by um, the management of interest rates, they overborrow. Uh, and we see that euphoria operating at the moment. But it doesn't originate with the banks. It originates with those active in the economy deciding to borrow or not to borrow. And I think it may sound like a fine distinction, but for me, it's an incredibly important distinction because we're looking at what the behavior of borrowers and we're not overstating the power of bankers or shadow bankers for that matter. I mean, one of the things, uh, Steve, that's missing from your book is, is a discussion about the shadow banking sector, which is now operating out there in the stratosphere and that is is invisible to regulators essentially and that is uh, likely to be spewing out enormous quantities of credit um, uh, against asset values that uh, are, can't be expected to maintain their value um, but Actually, anyway I just wanted to yeah. add that that remark that reminds me of two points I should have covered with Peter as well, by the way. The, point is just the model does include real values. Just you normally embed those on the canvas and have them with system dynamics rather than in the table itself. But one extension we've recently made to Minsky is the capacity to handle non-financial assets. So financial assets fundamentally are the claim you have on somebody else or somebody else has on you, and they therefore necessarily net to zero. But non-financial assets are things like a house, which you own, and it's not it's your asset, but nobody is a liability. So we've added the capacity for that in the most recent version of Minsky. And that then means we have a possibility of linking together the role of the financial system in generating the valuation of non-financial assets, which is an essential extension of the logic, which uh, was I've done in other form, but I haven't done inside uh, Minsky before. And on the yeah, Jubilee, yeah, sorry, yes, Peter. Yeah, first of all, Hicks and ISLM, I think the main problem is Hicks derived ISLM from the classical uh, loanable funds model. That's what he did. But that mm. was flawed. It was definitely flawed because you can never derive ISLM from the loanable funds model because the loanable funds model has only one asset one general purpose good. ISLM has money, has bonds, has central bank reserves and everything. So Hicks made a huge mistake deriving ISLM yeah. from IS, but nevertheless, the model uh, that he, what he falsely derived is a very useful model. And I can use it to explain many, many things that are going on. I cannot imagine with your model how you can say anything about what's happened in COVID and what the central banks did and what the what fiscal policy did. Can you explain anything about this with your, with your model? It's quite straightforward. In fact, I can actually, one thing I was going to cover is the fact that I can show a Jubilee is non-inflationary uh, by, by no, a model of that. That's to the point. What, with your model, what can you say about COVID, about the shocks of COVID, how central banks reacted, and how fiscal policy reacted? That's why I need a model for to explain my students. Enormous amount, on. because... It, 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 that, and that, that I do in extensive models, because what you're looking at, what you've looked at with Minsky so far, is just a model of a, a single, uh, the banking sector view alone. But the whole thing has been designed for interlocking uh, what we call godly tables. So this is the banking sector, but I'm showing there is the, the central bank, the government, the, the treasury fundamentally, and the public, which we can now show separately on, on separate screens to show the, how all the, all the accounts interrelate. And I can show the impact of central bank purchasing of, of government bonds, for example, as part of the model very easily. It took me about less than a day to build the model you're looking at here. And what I show is the impact of a jubilee um, and, and different ways the jubilee can be managed as both a non-inflationary and 
I, I think this is far richer than ISLM. And Peter, it, it sounds to me like you haven't read Hicks's uh, paper, I, I ISLM Explanation. It, I, I can even show you how he wrongly derived it. But nevertheless, well, still, please, 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 let's, let's, let's I, I know what Hicks wrote, but he made the yeah. mistake of, of deriving ISLM from, from the loanable funds model, which is absolutely impossible. But nevertheless, the model he created this way is very useful. But please show me how you can see anything meaningful about what's going on in the pandemic with your approach. There are the students sitting in your classroom. Peter, it's a straight. If you, if you tell yeah, I can. I can tell them if I model. If, if you, what we have happening in the pandemic is an enormous fiscal stimulus where the government is creating money and put it in people's oh, deposit yeah. accounts, and that is causing increase in the reserves at the same time. Uh, and that is that is where what's called the huge increase in savings has come from. It turns up in the model. It's extremely simple to illustrate the Minsky, far simpler than I removing a couple of ISLM diagram elements. ISLM, so I'm, I'm I sorry, I just, you, 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 I'm, I'm, I'm obviously more familiar with my software than you are. And I'm telling you, it's easy for me to model what's happened with the pandemic in, in Minsky. And it makes far more sense than doing it in ISLM, which would show a crowding out effect, which we haven't seen. What we've had is supply chain disruptions. You can, can, you can do many things with this, but, I, but still, I don't see with all of the, with your whole approach to make a simple explanation to the students in the classroom, what's happened? There was a demand shock, and then we had fiscal policy rating, we had monetary policy rating. And all this I can nicely explain uh, with ISLM. And, and how can, can you explain it? I think it obscures with ISLM, and that's why I've, well, I've done my whole work is to say we have to get rid of it. And I, you know, I end with Hicks's statement there. I mean, you, you're saying Hicks didn't know what he's talking about. I believe he did. And the final line, he says in, in the, uh, in the oh, this is the final paragraph, when one turns to questions of policy, looking towards the future instead of the past, the use of equilibrium methods is still more suspect. One cannot prescribe policy without considering the possibility that policy may be changed, which is an anticipating Lucas's critique. He then says, I accordingly, uh, can go, well, it's actually early in the paper, he says this, that it's only useful where equilibrium is uh, not a, a total distortion. And he said, it should just be no, no more than a classroom gadget to be superseded later on by something better. I think we should take Hicks's advice from 30 years ago and get rid of it and put something which is dynamic in there rather than the static equilibrium thinking if, if, if that is fundamental to ISLM. We're going to always disagree on that. You could show me easily what's happened in the pandemic with your approach. You can, yes, I can. You can only so don't expect me to do it in the middle of a discussion. Give me, give me more than five minutes to put it together. I mean, maybe you should, uh, we could continue. But Peter, this. can't you accept that just to, to base it on loanable funds is deeply, deeply flawed and deeply anti-Keynesian? That's yeah, what exactly, I resent exactly. about. But the ISLM model is not loanable funds. That's the key point. It has nothing to do with loanable funds. In the ISLM model, you have banks that can create money without relying on deposits. Loanable funds is that banks need deposits before they can lend. That's a, and, and it's, a loanable funds is a one, one commodity world. Yeah? And, and the difference is in, in ISLM, the LM curve are banks that can create money without, without deposits. That's, what the that's, that's, that's it. The financial system can... They can't, I, I create, think... they can't create money unless there are borrowers. No, they can't do that. of course, that's, but that's a completely different story. That's an essential part of ISLM that's, is deriving it from a constant money supply, which the government can vary, which is a but fiction. You, can, you can, can adjust ISLM. You can have a, can have a, can have a horizontal M curve. You can do anything. Well, Peter, you and I are going to take a totally different approach to economics in the future, and that's partly why I call this the new economics. Okay, I, maybe you both. As I told uh, on you, know, it has to. It has you, can, to <laughs> you can continue this, this yeah, discussion. But one thing, I, the I final it, test must be that you can explain in a simple, relatively simple way what's going on in reality. I think that's what matters. And of and, course, if you make assumptions uh, which are which are not realistic, it's a problem. But overall, what what counts in the end? Can you explain somehow what's going on? And I must say, Kim, with your approach, I don't really see how 
how one can somehow explain what's going on in reality. I, I don't see. I think I, I want. I want to have something which understand the students engineer as engineering students come out at the end of first year and understand dynamics, of systems, non-equilibrium behavior, and 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 the actual dynamics of the real world. And economic students come out with a mythical view of a system of moving lines on a flat by blackboard. And I think it's why we've got simpletons in economics rather than geniuses. So I'm sorry, I disagree with you fundamentally. Okay. I think we have that's, to break away from that. And that's I, I what I've written this book. Yeah, I, I think yeah, the point is made, and, and uh, we will don't we won't solve the, this uh, issue now. But it's I think it's very important to to continue to discuss mm -hmm. that. What I would like to ask uh, Steve, I mean, you're very skeptical, and reading your book, it's uh, it's a very straightforward uh, point against um, mainstream and and neoclassical and and anything. And it, when you quote Nordhaus, for example, it seems so evident. I mean, it's so crazy. Um, mm, it still, is crazy. What would you say? Isn't there something moving in in the domain in in economics? I mean, I mean, if, if you confront today's economists with these things, they wouldn't agree. Probably, very many of them won't agree anymore. Uh, so, what can you tell us? What is your view on this? Is there something going on? Is there something, even if not, it, not everyone it, it, agrees it, it, to your models, but? Um, well, economics, I think, is a dead end, and it's going to stay a dead end while we continue building on foundations like microeconomics and, frankly, ISLM. Um, this is why I said we need to power a revolution, uh, which we, which economics has managed to prevent, because we come back and fall back into these old micro grounds whenever the macro lets us down. Show me an ISLM model that predicted the financial crisis. I'd be fascinated to see that. Show me a DSG model that did that. That'd be equally fascinating. None of them did. And with people like Anne and myself are coming with all alternative analysis and saying, we saw the crisis coming. Your models didn't do it. Why the hell are you still defending them? And this is the problem. You can always get stuck in a rut. And if you want to get out of the rut, you've got to be kicked out of it, frankly. And that's what I'm trying to do by bringing engineering ideas into economics. Uh, so I think I, what's happening... Yes, 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 yes. But in answer to what Thomas has said, I think it is true that economics is moving, that economic students are asking questions, and that there are new generations uh, um, rising who are looking at this in a different way. And it is true, for example, here in Britain, our Prime Minister Theresa May assured us that there was no such thing as a magic money tree. And then the mm. next uh, Chancellor, uh, Shunak, uh, announced for the pandemic that there was a magic money tree, that it was possible uh, to finance, if you like, the almost nationalization of the economy. Um, and, you know, these are these are dramatic. These have been dramatic changes um, throughout the pandemic that must be changing minds. Now, of course, the ideology keeps coming back uh, right now. Our government is saying, no, we've got to pay for this and we need austerity. And so we're about to be plunged back into recession here. But for a whole year, it wasn't possible to argue that there isn't a magic money tree. You know, it was clear that the central bank was supporting the government in providing the finance, which was going to uh, to maintain businesses and keep keep the economy on a life support system at the very mom moment when it collapsed through no fault of its own. So, yeah. so you know, I think that must be Thomas a change in minds. But the ideology is still very deep, and we don't see it coming through in the form of policy. May, may the methods are very deep as well. On the, on the question of forecasting the financial crisis, you said ISLM did not forecast the financial crisis. This is true. But Steve, I looked at the two quotes that you made where you said you did forecast the crisis. One is a paper from 2006 where you forecast the financial crisis for Australia, but the financial, Australia didn't have a financial crisis. And the second paper that you mentioned is from September 2007, and there the financial crisis was already there. So I would be a little bit careful in making... Yes, I'm sure, Peter, and I've had this many minutes, and it annoys the hell out of me. So I'm going to talk over the top of you and tell you when I started talking about that. It began on December 18, 2006. And I have a conversation that was happened with my wife at the time when I was asked to do an expert witness case over predatory lending in Australia. And as part of that, 
Yeah. I made a throwaway line as an expert witness based on Minsky's financial instability hypothesis, saying levels of private debt have been rising exponentially compared to income. Now, I knew as an expert witness in the Australian legal system, I couldn't make a hyperbolic statement. So I thought I had to go and check the data and I'd find that I had to remove the word exponential because it surely wouldn't have been that. And it, I managed. I did a whole lot of routines in my favourite program, MathCat, at the time. So it took me a few hours that, that, to get there. Important. Can I finish, please? Can yeah. I finish? You've asked me a question here, a challenge to my integrity. I'm going to reply to you on that basis. And I did it, and I found that when I, I got the shock of my life when I plotted the debt to GDP ratio for Australia, and it was clearly exponential. In fact, the correlation between it, the pure exponential function and the ratio of private debt to GDP from 64 to 2007, or 2005, pardon me, was 0.9912. Doesn't get much closer. I didn't remove the word, but I thought, I've got to check the American data. So I managed to get the data from the American Federal Reserve, download that, compare it to GDP, and I got a correlation coefficient for them for 0.97 from 1952 until 2007. So my wife woke up in the morning and said, there's going to be a financial crisis, global. And I then tried to raise a alarm about it. There wasn't time to go through journals. So I did it through the newspapers and I mainly stuck with Australia. Now, the reason Australia didn't have a financial crisis is because it stopped the credit collapsing. And the reason it stopped credit collapsing is because I scared the shit out of the government at the time, the government of Kevin Rudd, and there were two consecutive days of the national broadcaster in Australia where they interviewed me one day and Kevin Rudd the next. Now, normally in that show, you get, if you're not the prime minister, you get what well, you get four or five minutes if you're lucky. I got 15. The next day, the prime minister is being inter interrogated about my views. And the day after, the week after that, they came up with a stimulus program doubling and trebling the growth, the grant for first home buyers to keep the first home, but the house, housing bubble going. So if you look at the credit, which is what Anne and I both know causes financial prices when it goes negative, in Australia's case, it didn't go negative and it was because of stimulus that I scared them into doing. And I criticised at the time. Okay, and that's then, why Australia didn't have a financial crisis. And then China came to the rescue of Australia. China, yeah, okay. China yeah, so you, anyhow, anyhow, you, but, but anyhow, you give two quotes. The one quote is on Australia, where there was no financial crisis in the end. And the second quote is from September 2007, when the crisis had already been there. It's so, not right. You think I wrote that in September no 2007, crisis. Peter? Do you, you, want, do you know nothing about publication lags? I wrote that in, in July. It took until September to be published. Now, please stop the giving me rubbish here. I get enough of that from journalists and politicians in Australia. I will not accept it from somebody who calls I'm themselves an academic. If you want to look at my, I have blog quotes going back. You can find I talked about Australia because that was my country. Okay. I'm nationalist enough to worry about my own country and talk about that. But I made comments about America as well. And you can find debt watch reports going back to 2006 where I talk about the American situation as well. Now, okay. pardon me, but you're being far more of a politician than I'm willing to be by making the sort of claims you're making there. I'm not going to tolerate them. Oh, there are the oh by That's the way, uh, Mark, I'm going to say Mark Kirsten, the question he's made a very good question about what's called ergodicity economics. It's extremely important. It's an alternative to the rational expectations efficient markers hypothesis nonsense that dominates finance and economics. And I recommend to anybody who doesn't know about ergodic economics to take a look at the work being done by Mark and by Peter, uh, by Ole Peters about an alternative approach to finance, which is far more realistic than the nonsense neoclassicals regurgitate in the efficient markets hypothesis. Okay. Um, I, I would, um, I, I mean, uh, at some point I was afraid that this will be too much of a har harmony discussion. Um, I'm convinced <laughs> now that uh, this was a wrong assumption. Um, but still, I, I would come back to, to the point, what is moving and, and how, what is your view of a paradigm shift and a paradigm, a new paradigm? Um, I mean, is that the big revolution that will come at some point or is there something about you know moving from time to time? If you look at former paradigm shifts inside the the, the one you you may consider as as one, but after the Second World War and the new 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 liberal paradigm shift, this has never come by one revolution at one day, but a, a lot of movements going going around. So, are there things that we would consider as positive and where you can? Well, if, if, yes, if, for example, the work of uh, Ole Peters and what he calls the economics. I see that as a very significant paradigm shift that completely inverts the whole efficient markets hypothesis and the idea, effectively, you can you, the, the idea that what you do is is given by expected expected uh, value and expected utility. That's a, that's a true paradigm shift from the finance side. Complex systems, this is another one coming into economics. And what, I've, what I do with my work on Minsky is fundamentally showing that complex systems 
gives you a totally different outcome to economics and your foundation is macroeconomics, not micro. In fact, I think micro should be, as it's taught, should be thrown away. It's a waste of time. Uh, all those the so-called lessons are lessons about a world that doesn't exist. As Veblen said many, many decades ago, we have a taxonomy of perfect competition, imperfect competition, monopoly and oligopoly, where you cannot find a single instance of that in the real world. Okay, we have, a, we have a, a taxonomical economics, which is not relevant to the actual real world. We need an evolutionary one. And back again, Jean Schumpeter was very good on that. We need an evolutionary theory of competition, not the static, the my, my, uh, a taxonomic one, which Veblen criticised so effectively. Mm, but then, in other words, there is, there, is, there is no revolution within neoclassical economics. There are changes of paradigm. There are shifts in what the Carters used to call the protective belt assumptions around the hard core. But the hard core of utility maximizing behavior, subjective valuation, everything in the real rather than the, the nominal, nominal, the monetary world, that is untouchable and unchanged. And so long as it stays there, we will never have a decent economics. Uh, and perhaps John, uh, one comment from, from your view on all this, I mean, the old, let's say the old paradigm, the, the market liberal one, one of the strengths of this paradigm has been that it was, the narrative was extremely simple and many, many ideas were extremely th simple. Um, now, proposing to have a new uh, paradigm, which um, has one element, one, uh, one big element, uh, complexity economics, or com complexity models, or however you call it, theory. Um, I mean, it doesn't seem so attractive as it seems maybe for us, as we see the, the point. Um, do you have any idea how to better bring this to a broader public, to, to these ideas? Well, um, you know, I, I, I think Steve's absolutely right that we're dealing with a complex system, you know, just like the energy system, we're dealing with a complex system. And so to make it too simple for the public is, is, is not easy. But it's, for me, the paradigm shift is, is really to reclaim some of the existing truths. This is a bit like we know we have in, in physics a theory of gravity. We don't need a new theory of gravity because gravity is gravity. You know, the monetary system is a system that's evolved over time and it, it is as it is. What we need for it to be is to be understood and to be accepted in the way that physicists accept gravity, in the way that aeronautical engineers understand gravity. And then within that understanding are able to invent and expand Uh, their their designs and, and their ideas, but they don't say, sorry, but gravity doesn't exist. <laughs> do you know what I mean? So I think part of what we have to do is to build on the truths that exist and that we've learned, you know, from back 1705, a great many of those truths were, in my view, uh, contained within the work of Don Maynard Keynes, who, by the way, is always described as being about fiscal policy and is always Uh, having attributed to him the fact that only fiscal policy can address a crisis. He was overwhelmingly concerned with monetary policy. His, his general theory was called the general theory of employment, money, interest and money. It wasn't called the general theory of tax and spend. Um, so uh, so now I think in a sense we've got to build on those foundations that we know to be true and that are true for all e economics and then accept that actually we've built institutions that have gone well beyond the capacity of the economy to cope with those institutions. And I'm thinking of the shadow banking system, which is chaotic and, and anarchic. And, and doesn't, if you like, obey the laws, the, the economic, economically equivalent laws of gravity and, and therefore endangering the whole of, the, of society and of the environment, because, of course, it's encouraging uh, more and more extraction of, of, the, of the Earth's finite assets. So I think it's about building on existing truths and, and, and then accommodating the changes in the institutions and the behavior that we've encouraged through these uh, liberal ideas, uh, market theory ideas. Okay, uh, Peter, uh, perhaps just a, a question on money matters. Is that something that goes, I mean, that more and more economists would uh, accept as an idea in, in Germany? Well, I think uh, what one can see is that in 
in the prestigious US universities in Harvard and Princeton and so on, uh, modern uh, macroeconomics are still macroeconomics without money. So they are still yeah. totally based on the load of a funds approach. There are still no banks that can create money independently. And I think here, a real revolution is, is definitely needed. Right? So I think that's, that's absolutely so. Also, the financial crisis has shown that this loanable funds paradigm is completely obsolete. It still is a dominant model in, in all, all uh, top mainstream uh, papers and, and, and approaches. I think here, here we definitely need, need a revolution. Okay, we have a couple of minutes left. There are some questions and we promised um, to the audience to uh, hand over the, the questions and let the panelists um, know about them, answer them, and we'll send back for those who we can't discuss. There are some very fundamental questions um, like, uh, are you in favor? I think it's a question for Steve in, uh, for, of a constant model supply system given that credit creates problems. Mm. Okay, I'll just actually, one of the questions there from uh, Ivan about uh, explaining how government deficits add to the uh, uh, money supply. Uh, if you go to my um, Prof. Steve Keen website slash Minsky, you'll find I have some models there that illustrate that. Also, most recent, recent models on my, on my uh, Patreon page uh, where I illustrate it quite straightforwardly because once what, what, what you can show with a, the double entry bookkeeping approach that I take with those tables. Of course, you have assets on one side and liabilities on the other. Money is fundamentally the liabilities of the banking the banking sector. Okay, so if you want to increase the money supply, create money or destroy it, you must make a change on the liability side, but not two changes. There must be a change therefore on the liability side and also a change on the assets. Now, when you look at the banking sector, the banking sector creates money by increasing deposits and by increasing loans. Uh, and the deposit and the loans, of course, are linked. So the person who borrows the money gets the deposit as well most of the time. So there's, that's, that's the uh, money creation by private banks. With the government, the government puts money in private bank accounts and puts it in the reserves at the same time. So the reserves go up and the the, the deposits go up at the same time. That's how government deficits create money. And then what you get as a result of that, if you feed through the tables, and I show that on the my models you'll find inside the Modeling with Minsky book that I've mentioned at the end of my presentation there, which you can find on profstevekeen.com slash Minsky. Uh, download that book and you'll find quite a few models discussed there. So if the government runs a deficit, what it's doing is transferring money from the treasury account uh, it, it, it accounted the treasury at the central bank to the uh, reserve accounts of the private banks. And that transfer effectively puts the treasury into negative equity when you look in terms of financial claims. And if you look at the aggregate data, that is the commonplace. All, almost all treasuries around the world are in negative equity in terms of purely financial assets. And that's a necessity for the creation of money. So uh, I do mention that extensively in, in that uh, book, Modeling in Minsky, much more so than I do uh, in the, the short one. As Anne said, it's 25,000 words. It's very, very short. Uh, but modeling, modeling in Minsky is about 60,000 words and lots of mathematics and lots of models inside there. And you will find the answer to your question there and you'll find models that illustrate it as well. Okay, um, thanks, uh, Steve. Um, some other questions which um, were about growth and so on, but I, I would su uh, suggest that you may uh, send us um, comments if you want, um, so we can don't need to open these larger discussions now. Um, except for one question, maybe, um, will there be a German edition, a German edition of the New economics. You better book. translate that for me, yes. <laughs> so not yet in, in the planning, um, but maybe. So we'll see. Um, then, well, I, I think we had a very lively discussion, very um, hard discussion on ISLM and uh, the models. I think that shows that there's a long discussion still needed and, and some uh, discussion, even between people who are um, maybe, let's say, largely on the same side of, of uh, how they view uh, economics and, and the world. Um, but that, that may be part of a paradigm shift. That's what we learned uh, when we studied history of paradigm shifts. That's something which takes time and um, a lot of elements come into place and need to be in place 
I don't want to be too pessimistic, but we had a, a, a seminar some time ago in Paris where a French historian said, maybe this, the financial crisis as a triggering moment for change uh, was not the big one compared to the 29 uh, banking crisis, but more uh, 1914. And that leads to a very pessimistic view, which is that in between, in, the, in between the wars, there was a lot of thinking about how to change, but not really enough. And it was only the very big crisis and then the shock of the Second World War who, that really led first in the US and then in the rest of the world of, to something which was, even if you don't see the, a complete paradigm shift as, as you would like to have seen it, Steve, but that was a new uh, paradigm after the Second World War. So we very much hope that we don't need such a catastrophe to, to get to a, a, a very <laughs> new paradigm shift. But it shows that there's a urgent, a very urgency. And if you look at um, what's happening in policy and uh, with um, Biden's program and the time scale until the middle elections, you see that there's real urgency. So many thanks for any contribution, mm -hmm. I think, that leads to some this change, uh, whatever the outcome will be. Thanks, Steve. Thank, thanks, Anne. Thanks, Peter, for this very lively and very good discussion. And see you soon. Um, and have a good night and good day in Australia. And Thomas, I'd love to get a copy yeah. of that recording. Thank you. If I can, I'd like to place it on my website as well. Yes. So I'll get a copy from you later. Thank you. No okay. Thank you very okay. much. Thank, Thank you. Bye, Anne. Bye, Peter. Bye, -bye. Cheers. Bye.